Okay, people coming in now. Hold on. <laughs> Afternoon, everybody. I'll just um, let the, everybody come in that's slowly filtering in now. Um, if you give us a couple of minutes and then we'll, we'll get started with everyone. Okay, so let me just check. Attendees here. So you guys can't see the attendees, can it? It's just me that can see them. Okay. So that looks like everybody's sort of on. So if we get cracking from here, and then some people can more filter in if, that, if that's the way you need to do it. So Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're all keeping well in these uh, current lockdown quarantine times. Um, since the last time that we did this session, which is now um, exactly two weeks ago, uh, I have done numerous DIY jobs and managed to get a slight more tan by sitting in the garden in between these Zoom calls. And um, hopefully we got a bit better on Zoom as well. So I'm getting uh, numerous Zooms every day. Um, a bit of housekeeping first before we kind of crack on. The um, the session buttons along the bottom, depending on what you're using, if you're using tablet or PC or smartphone, there should be some buttons that you can see along the bottom. There is an option to raise your hand if you, if you need to ask something specific, but the two methods that we prefer are, there's a chat function if you just want to talk generally to each other or, or respond to certain things, but there is a Q&A button as well in there. So if you wanted to ask a specific question about, well, last time it was all things furlough and retention schemes and lending, you want to ask anything specific then please put it in the Q&A and then throughout the conversation um, I'll make sure that John or Victoria uh, answers that and um, after this as well last time we had a couple of unanswered questions but we'll try and follow up the session with a uh, an email and hopefully a video of this to kind of go over the, some of the some of the key points so why are we here and um, well today is the second session of Entrepreneurs Club virtual and um, if any of you've been to any of our um, live sessions. They usually take place in the old hall and um, started them just over a year ago and what it's really designed to do is it's designed to uh, create a safe space for business owners um, to look at different elements of business, get better about doing business and do sort of more business together. So with all of the unprecedented climate that we're in at the moment, John and Victoria and I, the founding members, decided to put these uh, sessions on and it's around the idea of a Q&A. Um, what we sort of uh, got pretty straightforward from, from the beginning of this was, John was getting quite a lot of repeat questions, so was Victoria and so was I from, from my clients and our clients. Um, and just generally we were seeing them out and about there in the uh, LinkedIn and social media world. So we thought actually what we'd do is collect some of those together. We've been asking for questions over the past couple of weeks and sort of put this on as a regular session so people can come here and have a chance to, to listen to a couple of the key things. Maybe you pick something from there, but if there is something specific, you've got the option to, to dive in. Um, the session is planned for the next hour. Um, if there, um, we shouldn't run over, we didn't run over too much last time. And like I say, if we don't get too many questions, we'll try and answer them before. But without further ado, um, if I could just introduce John Davis from John Davis Accountants and Victoria Brown from um, High Performance Consultancy, and myself, uh, Alex Barnes, or full Sunday name, Alexander J. Barnes, if I'm in trouble, um, from AJ Barnes Financial Planning. So without further ado, if we get on with the, with the Q&A that we've got, we've got a few prepared questions that we've been asked over the last couple of weeks. So, um, Victoria, if we could start with you, I think it's sort of a prudent time to look at what changes have been made around the coronavirus retention scheme since uh, your last talk. Okay, so we're now on the sixth update of the scheme. Uh, so that sort of gives you a flavour of how many times we've talked and, and given advice and then had to sort of amend the advice accordingly. Uh, last time we spoke, we were told, obviously, that um, it would end in May. So you could furlough people till the end of May. That's now changed and that's been extended to the end of June, which is 
really helpful to be honest because there'll be a lot of clients a lot of employers who potentially are a little bit worried and think they may have to make people redundant. Um, what you would hope now is if we do sort of um, relax the lockdowns shortly and we are able to sort of drip feed people back into the workforce, then maybe we will save some more jobs along the way. So that, that was a good move from the government. Um, the other change was the application as well for furlough. So before the last time we spoke, John and I told you that it was the 28th of February. So as long as your employees were on the payroll from the 28th of February, they would be able to claim furlough. That has been extended now to the 19th of March, which um, again just allows more people to be able to be covered by furlough if they were not beforehand. So that's been obviously and an improvement in, in the scheme as well for people. And a question that came up quite a lot for us the last time and John and I had um, a, a debate and we couldn't really give you the answer because it was quite grey, was around holidays. So quite a lot of people asked us last time, if you furlough an employee, can they take holiday during this period of time? And Obviously the concern is the longer that we are on lockdown and the longer that we have people sort of furloughed, then they will accrue leave during that period of time, um, as will everybody that is home working as well. And quite a lot of um, business owners are looking at this now and thinking, right, well, what I don't want is when we do go back to work, to have everybody trying to put in their application for leave when actually we need to hit the ground running. So the the new sort of um, the, the 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 changes were good. The clarity is now there to say that you can, and uh, when so, when somebody is furloughed, you can actually allow them to take leave, but you would have to give them the top up. So if you're only paying somebody at eighty percent, then during that period of leave, they would have to be topped up to a hundred percent. So there's there's been a little bit more clarity now since the last time that we spoke. Okay, and just picking up on that similar sort of thread, I know that there's been a question asked around childcare commitments uh, mm -hmm. right now and sort of how they work and how you manage them, uh, manage sort of staff that have got childcare commitments. How, how's that sort of working? So <clears throat> again, it was good that we've got a little bit more of an update around um, childcare because at the beginning it was quite grey. So the advice we were given from the government was that if you had sort of childcare commitments that you'd have to take unpaid parental leave, which nobody wants to do. That has now they have extended furlough to allow people that have childcare commitments actually to be able to be furloughed if, if necessary. And um, so that is absolutely a consideration. I had um, a question a couple of weeks ago from a client and they had two members of staff, one of which you had they needed to furlough one of them. Um, it is exactly the same job, but one of which had childcare commitments, the other didn't. So they decided to furlough the person who had the childcare commitments it was far harder for them to do you know at sort of 100 percent within their role and um, what i would note is that obviously people that are not furloughed and you do still need them to work and they have got childcare commitments you know i being one of them now um as are, as are all of us with these sorts of children and i'm now a teacher as well as um an md which is interesting uh we, you've just got to take that into consideration, haven't you? And I think um, most of my clients have been very flexible, very open, and had those open and honest conversations with their members of staff just to try and find sort of a balance between the two. Uh, you know, some, some people have got weird and wonderful ways of working at the moment. They'll get up, you know, incredibly early to work and then sort of... Um, have to earlier and then their partner will work a bit later and they'll just find a way to, to sort of to, to meet the needs um some clients have done things like take taking some holidays as well so they've used the opportunity to maybe still get some productivity out of their member of staff but albeit maybe a shorter week and use some of their leave entitlement that they are accruing during this period of time so that's great because that gives you you know, you, you get in that work-life balance for the member staff, you're also using some of that leave. But I think you, you have got to be fair and reasonable during this period of time because it is it is a juggling act and, and we're all doing our best, aren't we, during this time? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you very much. So that brings me on actually quite nicely to this. What I'm finding is there is a 
work life uh, sort of blur with sort of working from home and being in lockdown. But then also, um, John, if I can direct to you, um, one of the sort of the questions that we've received here is can a furloughed employee or director attend online networking meetings, including BNI? So, you know, while we are all working from home, um, I think there is a little bit of a mixed message around um, if somebody is on furlough, whether they can continue this type of activity or whether they should be more expected to, to stop. So what's your thoughts on that? Well, I guess I might refer to my HR expert, I'll be honest, on, on, on that one. Um, <laughs> I, 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 as, in, as in generally, because I think I, I, I have probably an opinion, but I'm not the, the, the expert because it is one of the most debated topics at the moment of what a director can do and, and, and kind of what's said in the, the guidance is that they can effectively do their statutory duties. The statutory duties usually include um, things like the company's house filings, HMRC filings. There are seven statutory duties that company's house also lists which are a bit kind of wide and woolly about um, you know do we, you know, not have a conflict of interest and what have you. It's, it, it's not but it's not really okay what tasks can you and can't you do other than those statutory filings so on the face of it if you are an employee or a director or anybody who is furloughed and claiming the job retention scheme grant you shouldn't be doing anything other than those bits and bobs um, but I mean I, I'd be interested for Victoria's take on things like networking because to, to me common sense says that as the director do they want you to remain claiming furlough and or, or have a company that goes down the pan or does common sense say that at least if you're doing a few things push the out if you're not doing the day-to-day -day job but i think as the guidance is that, that appears to be the rule and uh, i'd be interested in, in Vic's take on it so victoria yeah. is is john right um <laughs> <laughs> oh dear uh yeah, yeah. I mean, as, as you say, John, it's very difficult because the guidance, you know, I think by probably the 10th update to the guidance, we'll have clarity on this. Um, but what we've done is we've sort of struck a balance because one of my concerns and, and maybe just move away a little bit from a director and think about an employee now of a business. And we've had some clients that have done things like they've been really, they've been terrified of exactly this. They've been terrified that their employee will continue to work, you know, maybe uh, bring profit into the business. And as a result of that, they will not be able to get the claim for furlough. But they've done things like taking away their laptops, taking away their mobile phones. And my concern there is that actually feels like a punishment to me of the people that have been furloughed in your business. You know, it feels like you've sort of suspended somebody from duty. So, what we've done with our clients is obviously provided the paperwork and that was something that another sort of change that came in recently from the government to say that you have to have that written documentation now between the employee and the employer to say that you have been furloughed um, and keep it for five years so, so it's interesting to see what they're going to do uh, in terms of investigation moving forward but for us you know we, we've put in that we sort of outlined in there sort of some of the requirements of furlough so i think it's, it's trying to strike the balance isn't it of actually allowing your employees to be able to do something so if it is the likes of networking then yes you know you, if they do attend networking bni for example has really good training so you are allowed within the guidance to be able to do training so there is an argument that technically you could view this networking as a, a level of training as long as you don't bring any money into the business and make a profit but there has been that um that concern by particularly a lot of people in sales roles that if they do nothing to your point john for three months then they are going to have to take it takes three months to build a pipeline doesn't it so i think arguably our guidance has been to people be cautious and you know and be very careful in what in what your employees are doing but equally if they do want to sort of upskill or they do want to sort of attend a networking event, if that's more for the future pipeline, then we can't see that as being a problem. It's more at the moment of a case of if they are, you know, being seen to bring business in now, and you know, you, you are circumnavigating a, a scheme to try and make money out of it. But I, I think it's, it's still not particularly clear. I, I agree with you, John, it's, it's not. And, and, you know, being a BNI member myself as well, it's difficult because BNI guidance is that you can actually, if you furloughed, attend BNI. 
you know, so they are, their stance is quite clear at the moment that they are encouraging people that are furloughed to still be an active member. Um, and, you know, some of which are in sort of some leadership roles, aren't they? So arguably they are volunteering to do that. I think in, in my own, so I'm in b as well, in, in our b chapter, it has been, um, the policy has been put out there just the same as everybody else, but I think we're all friends in the same group. So I think we've understood actually if somebody doesn't feel comfortable and feels like an investigation might happen in future where they would come back to that and maybe pull that to pieces, then I think that a few people have themselves made the decision to temporarily sort of play it safe. As it were, but the group's been pretty supportive, so that's nice. It's good. Um, okay, so moving on to a little bit more about pounds and pence and finance and so on and so forth. So, John, direct to you. Um, question here, very simple When will I receive my small business grant? <laughs> simple one to ask about. Mm. Um, hard <laughs> one to answer. I, I think what, what, what we see so the small business grant um, is the the grant of either £10,000 um, for small businesses who are um, eligible for small business rates at least have a premises with a rateable value under £15,000. There's then a similar grant for the retail and hospitality, which it's if your premises of rateable value is less than £15,000, it's the same amount. If it's between fifteen and 51000 you get a £25,000 grant. Now, the, the, the claim forms went online for many councils at, at the end of March. Um, Liverpool was the 30th or 31st of March, and kind of nosy mural and, 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 and the like sector were about the same. Some of them around the country that aren't live yet. Um, so the councils are, are quite far apart in terms of where they are in, in doing this, and also in terms of the claims received. So we have out of our, our clients, um, to my knowledge, um, I don't know precisely all of them, but we, we've had a handful, we, we had a few through very, very quickly the first week of April. Then we seem to have a gap, and then we've had two or three in the last few days, but the vast majority haven't had theirs yet. All of the ones we've had so far have actually been in retail and hospitality. Um, I don't know if that's coincidence, um, but that, that that is kind of where, where where we are but the majority of our clients haven't had their grant yet um the idea is it would be paid out within april um and obviously april itself is, is running out because the idea is you know people need, need 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 the cash so when i do not know um what i do is that they are they are working hard i mean joe anderson was saying last week that he had staff in the whole of the east bank holiday weekend processing these grants to try and get the money out um, but it is a little bit kind of wait and see. Okay, and just as a follow up to that, again, probably a, a simple question, difficult answer. But what are the tax implications of the grant? So people have heard that they pay tax on them. What's what's your view? Ultimately, yes, it it, it is taxable. It's income, um, and that's the same with all the grants. So they have explicitly said it for the self-employed scheme which pays three months worth of your average profits out and, and will be paid to self-employed people in June. Um, they explicitly stated on that that it will be taxed in your next tax return. Um, but to an extent, um, unless there are a few exceptions, but pretty much every grant is actually taxable. It is it, it's income and goes into your tax return. Um, so I guess you can't claim too much because if you're getting £10,000 now, to pay um, if you have limited, it could be 19% corporation tax in whatever they may be in a year from now, because um, a lot of it is about actually getting cash into your business now to help you through. Um, I'd rather have £8,100 than nothing. So um, mm. I wouldn't complain about the tax, but, but, but yes, it, it is taxable. And, and Stuart, Doug, uh, Doug Dill there has just put a question on, um, which is um, from this morning, he's been on the professional Liverpool Zoom call. And they'd said that they paid 48 million out already and were turning stuff around me really quickly and had a range of things in place to get it done. So um, that's quite an interesting. Yeah, I think I think that, I mean, that as an anecdote, please to be with Vicky or clients, but so we, we've probably got about, I'm not sure how many we've got who are eligible. Best part of 100, we've had about five of these paid out so far. So it is still a small proportion. Yeah, I found that. Um, We've got quite a few clients in, in Manchester and, and they seem to have been paid out quite quickly as well. So I've not compared between the two, but 
they do seem to be getting their claims turned around quite quickly in all sectors as well. Yeah. Okay, great. And I suppose turning to uh, all of us here as, as, a, as a group, so it's a question here, which I think has come in. So what are we finding to be the biggest challenges for employers when staff are working from home? So Vic, what, what's, what's your thoughts on that? <clears throat> I think um, at the beginning it was probably just the transition. And I think if you if you didn't have a home working policy before, and you've never worked from home and obviously that was a, a, just a challenge in itself around technology and making sure because it was such a for some people that were in denial for quite a long time they literally went from you know I spoke to some clients who thought that lockdown wasn't going to happen on the one day and then day two you know we, we were all getting our stuff and, and, and leaving the office and um, what what I'm concerned about now is and what I'm finding is um, mental health is becoming quite a big concern um, a lot of you know you've, you've seen it no doubt in in the, the media recently um, you know that has become a real real fear that actually mental health and well-being will become um, you know arguably a greater killer than the, the coronavirus the way um, if we stay in lockdown for much longer so we are doing a lot now with clients to actively help them around their communication with their employees so you know what how are they um, sort of communicating each day, what are they using? I think we talked about it last time, didn't we? Some of us are using the likes of Teams and, and Zoom and, and ways to sort of keep actively um, in communication with your team at all times. Other, other things that we're doing as well is obviously those touch points. I think it's really important for everybody and I can share this later of just reminding your, your people of where they can get help if they are starting to struggle a little bit with the isolation. So there are still, you know, again, it's something that um, has been heavily publicised. There's a lot of support still out there, contrary to, I think, what some people think that maybe there's not because of, of COVID. And then, and then the other side of it, we've now got the consideration of what do we do to bring people back and that transition back? Because I think the sort of the problems that we've had in isolation we're going to have similar problems moving out of isolation so that they are things that i would advise everybody now to start to consider when we do when lockdown is sort of removed or you know whatever that looks like whether we still have some level of, of sort of their social distancing but how are we going to bring people back into the workplace that have been used to being at home so um yeah lots, lots a lot for us to think about at the moment but uh Productivity and mental health is probably the, the biggest concerns that we've got at the moment around home working. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I think that actually it's it's been a strange. Uh, we, ultimately, we are living through a history lesson here, and I think that everybody is trying to figure. There is no template for this about the rights and wrongs of what you should do because this has been unprecedented. But I think what what I've tried to do in the practice is try and try and keep things as normal as, as possible to a degree. So anybody who's uh, still working from home, checking in regularly with them um, and sort of even just small things sort of like sending, we sent out uh, last weekend, just like a, a little perk box of like a, a bar and then like a few coffees and a few other bits and pieces just so people could be at home and still have a brew together almost and set up a, a Zoom in oh, nice. discuss figures. Um, but the, I feel like the conversation has started to change because, you know, that first couple of weeks were very much going into, going into lockdown and trying to figure out what that looks like. I hadn't really heard of Zoom six weeks ago or something like that. And now it's every working, uh, waking day of my life. But now the conversation is changing more to that. Well, OK, well, there's light at the end of the tunnel. What, how do we transform businesses and what does that happen? So, John, what's happening within um John Davis accountants for you and, and staff and how, how are you working things at the moment? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess similarly, we, we have um, we, we have a morning team meeting when we're in the office and we have a morning team meeting now when we're not in the office. Um, obviously, it's done by video call now. Um, we've been using Zoom for well, yeah, a couple of years at, at, at least, um, but usually for people, um, clients who are a long way away, now we're using it for clients who are you know, a few hundred yards away. But for the team, yeah, it's, 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 um, I mean, it's, obviously it's not the same as being together 
and it does at least have that interaction and, and brings everyone together to start of the day. It's probably a longer team meeting than it would be for the office because it has a bit more chit chat because you don't get that throughout the day. Um, we have a there's a WhatsApp group for the social chit chat um, and what have you, pictures of your cat, dog, what you're having for tea, that kind of thing. Um, I think the the impact though is because we all we all set up to work remotely and and then you know it's all we've got cloud software and laptops or what have you anyway. It's when you're all doing it once, it isn't as efficient. Um, you can't. It's, it's that thing of just sticking your heads up and asking for help. Um, and, and we had two new starters on like the first or second of March as well. Um, so for them, feeling part of the team is hard. You know, when you've only been in the office for you know not even three weeks when we're into lockdown, but also in terms of training them as well, it is more difficult when. The, 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 if the onus falls on one person all the time because if you know a bit stuck on some silly little thing on software you can't say can anybody help it has to be i'm going to ring a specific person so i think you know it's not quite as efficient however you know there are also some advantages as well in terms of there are less disturbances and pausing and thinking about meetings um meetings last a little shorter as well i think because you know because I mean, certainly you've got the travel thing you've saved on, which is great. But um, some of the meetings are actually more efficient. I think just some of the working isn't quite as efficient. Overall, though, it probably it swings and roundabouts and, and it's, it's, it's working. But I think everyone is looking forward to being back in the office in one way or another to the interaction. Yeah, and I think that actually that sort of change in uh, rhetoric towards forward looking instead and sort of what's going to happen in future. There's a question here which has come up really, which is a more financial question. Um, which is if a recession hits, how likely, uh, how, sorry, how long are we likely to see effects of this? Um, and, and how does this affect things generally? So um, this is a question that I've had quite a lot actually, um, because obviously it impacts uh, quite a lot. But the two, the two things that I would generally separate out are, um, your life, the economy, and the market. So those three things are very three three very distinct pillars uh, when we're discussing this. But the two which often get thrown together are the economy and the financial market. So when people are looking at sort of potentially turning that corner at some point in the future, um, at the moment, obviously, we are still very much in the eye of the storm here. So it's very hard to, to look at What's going to happen but what what's usually pays dividends in this area is, is sort of to look back over uh history so uh history does not repeat itself but it rhymes so that's the adage that we use at the moment so to share a chart with you this is sort of some <clears throat> some major indices that we've looked at so it's the um data stream uk index and what it looks at is it goes back over the past 40 years and it has a look at where was the market um, data stream one three and five years a year later, three years later, and then five years later. So you can see that the year is in the blue, the green is three years later, the, the light blue is five years later. So absolutely that while we're in this period, it's, it's, it's very scary, people get sort of uh, very worried about it, particularly with the 24 hour news stream that we're getting all the time. But it's, it's worth looking at the moment, um, what we have experienced in comparison to the last sort of financial crash, which was 2008, 2009. So far, the impacts have actually been not massive in terms of the financial markets, but that is hugely down to the liquidity volume, which has been pumped in by central governments and, uh, and banks. And um, so to give you an idea, the, the worst of the volatility that I've seen this year was probably a week and a half, maybe two weeks, um, in terms of a financial market impact. If you were to go back to 2008, if anybody remembers that far back and looks at how long the uh, how long the impacts were felt, it was probably the best part of five and a half months, and they were much heavier than where they are now. We were taking some really rocking blows on certain days, which is all around this Northern Rock February 08 kind of time. So um, ultimately. Scary, yes, but um, patterns do emerge out of this type of thing. And people's health and well-being is the number one thing. But at the moment, what we're finding is that most analysts are saying that Q2 and Q3 of this year, a recession now is baked into the numbers of the market. 
um, potentially moving into Q4. And um, if then obviously it extends into Q1 and Q2 next year, then we would expect to see another correction in the markets as a whole. But that's that's sort of a bit of an update um, on, on how things are seen from, from our, our lens. And um, staying with the idea of, of finance, actually, one thing which a lot of my clients have mentioned, and I know, John, we've spoken about this before, is the coronavirus loans. So the seat bills or civils, as I heard it called the other day, civil for <laughs> hours. Um, and the question is, how long will it take to get a coronavirus loan and what information do I have to give? So perhaps a, a, a bit for both of you there. What's, what's your thoughts? Um, I think in terms of the time, I mean, there, 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 is, there is a backlog. I mean, there's been lots of criticism about the speed of getting these things out. In the weekend, about 6,000 loans had been approved and gone through out of 300,000 applications or something. Um, and the vast bulk that have been approved are from that Western RBS um, because we kind of own them, so they're morally obliged to do it quite quickly. Um, I, I, I actually got a meeting um, later today, a board meeting of a client for the board to sign off on us borrowing um, because we are, we are, we, we're approved. We've got um, three quarters of a million pounds on, on a, and, and actually one of the things actually the, the interest rates and what we're seeing that, that those are coming through the banks so that they are at good rates. So this, this one is at 2.83%. Um, and we have no capital or interest repayments in year one. So we don't pay back anything in year one and then we're paying it back in over two years after that. So it's a very attractive rate. Um, that is from NatWest and that, that's been approved you know, relatively quickly, you know, what, three weeks, four weeks after the scheme was launched. Um, I have a lot of clients who I guess are in, in, in the queue. Um, the good thing is because we have contacts with some of the banks we've been able to help and actually get them to speak to the real person because the starting point with most is putting special interest in but then the bank to get back to you to start the process um, and they are again they're drafting in I mean I've spoken to quite a few people who work at the banks and again over the bank holiday weekend lots of them are in effect just ringing back people from the special interest to then start the loan application um, one bank manager told me that it then takes him three to four hours to process each application um, he personally had 40 um, that he had to process, which is there for three or four weeks worth of work. So th th there is a, it's, it's not, it's certainly not been as quick as obviously they'd have hoped in the first place. Um, I think the banks are struggling in terms of resource. Generally speaking, they're not taking applications from anyone who isn't a current customer because they don't have the resource to do so. As normally, this, actually be, this is a good way of them usually getting businesses is, is through a loan. Um, they have to sit and look after their own first because of, of that resource. So it, it's, not, it's not quick, but they are happening and things are moving. And of course, things in the background, you know, they're bringing more resource to try and get stuff moving quickly. Um, and in terms of um, things such as the information, generally speaking, in terms of what they'll loan, is they're, looking, they're only really looking to lend money that, that genuinely is to cover what you've lost due to coronavirus. Um, so they're not lending for you to buy plant machinery, assets, marketing, or what have you. It is supposed to be what you will have lost. Um, and therefore, they are generally asking for um, cash flows to show the impact. Now, the thing with the cash flow is quite difficult. Right now, we don't, nobody really knows the impact. But as long as they're sound and solid assumptions, they're looking for um, accounts, and potentially management accounts prior to the crisis to see that you were a viable business. Because, of course, while the banks are still on the hook for 20% of these loans, they don't want to lend to effectively is failing anyway. It should be a viable business that is only currently struggling due to coronavirus. So they want to be viable beforehand and in the cash flow to show the dip, what you need, and therefore um, how you'll come out of it and you'll be viable afterwards. Um, generally, they're asking as well things like, and think that we filled in um, basically to to confirm that for example you've already gone to um you, you, you've covered every other source of, of government support so you have either you know you furlough staff and claim through that you've claimed your small business grant etc etc i.e the, the loan is is the last resort um so th there's quite a lot of information to, to to fill in but actually when you actually read the questions they look there's a lot of them but they're relatively simple to answer. Um, we had one the other day where ultimately most of the questions were pretty much one sentence answers because it was pretty clear. 
the cash flow wasn't the most sophisticated of cash flows because that top line of the income was was it's up in the air now when we don't even know when we're coming out of lockdown it's hard to to, to, to be clear on, on the impact of this from the other day it was in, in 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 hospitality as well and it's likely that hospitality venues won't be open until late summer perhaps so if you if you're looking for one it's much as it is it's you know start the process sooner rather than later because it will take a little while mm. but if you if you, know, if you if you follow it through and you can answer the questions and put you know put the application in speak to your your, your bank manager or what have you is that the rates that are coming through certain high street banks are, are, are very attractive rates and no matter what you don't pay interest in year one anyway that's funded by the government um and but the rates are i mean obviously base interest rates as low as it's ever been the rates on the loans are actually you know are, are very good rates you might you might have answered this already john forgive me if i missed it but um i've i've heard this as well the questions come in specifically around pgs or personal guarantees on loans under two hundred fifty thousand. um does this apply still on c bills or any other business loans what, what's the what's this score there at the moment yes yeah, so um any 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 c bills loan of less than two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, there is no personal guarantee required. That 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 was one of the things early on that a lot of the banks were asking for personal guarantees, um, and the council stepped in, and that 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 was that was removed two perhaps three weeks ago now. Um, if it's above two hundred fifty thousand pounds, there will be a personal guarantee required. However, it will not include your your main residential home, so that would be safe anyway. Um, Generally speaking, the banks, if, if you do go to the bank for a loan, the starting point is if you are a, a very safe bet anyway, is, is to use a standard loan. Um, so most, they all have slightly different rules. But generally, if you want less than £25,000, they push you for a, a standard product. Um, if you have, if, if the business has security, i.e. tangible security of building or, or plant and machinery or something, they would probably look to, to a standard product anyway. The C bills is supposed to be for those who would not be lent to or need an amount bigger than they could normally borrow. Um, that's where you get to the C bills. But what they're doing is they're offering quite attractive rates on the standard loans as well. So it's not a case of I, I have to appear bad to get the C bills loan and get a good rate. Mm. They are trying to align the rates across the standard products as well. In terms of the guarantees, yeah, less, less than two hundred fifty thousand pounds. There is no need for personal guarantee. Over two hundred fifty thousand pounds, there will be a personal guarantee, but it would, wouldn't include your your kind of main residence. Okay, um, thanks for that. So, um, looking at the um, the furlough scheme and moving on to that a little bit more specifically. So, I'm turning to you here, Victoria, as our expert uh, panelist. Um, the question that's come in um, around the job retention scheme is a couple really. So what level of contact can you have with your team when they're furloughed? And one that I'm interested in as well, I've, I've heard a few things about alternating furloughed employees. So sort of switching and matching that in. So what, what's your thoughts on that? Okay, well, I think we kind of touched upon um, the contact before a little bit, didn't we? So I think that to, to the point that we made before in terms of your employee when they're fellow cannot work for you. It's a bit, little bit strange because they can't work for you, but they could actually go and get a job somewhere else and work for someone else during that time with, with your, your consent. Um, they can't be seen to make a profit for you, but they can, um, they can do training and they can volunteer. So um, what, in terms of contact, a lot of my clients are, you know, as I mentioned before, this isn't a punishment to people. This is something that you, a lot of people are doing to just try and retain their, their staff during this period of time. So that communication is very important. Uh, a, a lot of, of clients, we really are encouraging them to make sure that they do use the likes of Zoom, the likes of Teams, and include them. So, you know, if you're doing, say, a, a weekly quiz, which a lot of people seem to be doing at the moment, make sure you include the furlough staff. Um, it's also important for them to have the, the business updates as well. So three months is a long time. A lot can happen during that three months. So you don't want to parachute people back into your business. You don't want them to feel like they've done anything wrong. They need, you need to ensure that they are 
clear on what's going on within the business and there's nothing wrong with doing that it's just that you can't directly instruct them to do any work uh, we, we did mention I think on the last uh, call that we had just to be a little bit careful as well around training so if a member of your staff does want to train whilst they're furloughed you just need to be a little bit careful around national minimum wage as well so if they are being paid 80 percent and they are on a training day for a day they could arguably fall below national minimum wage so that's why you need to speak to your accountant just to be safe that you don't breach any any wages or any sort of national minimum wage laws um and then to the other point there uh, alex just around furlough and rotation a lot of people are doing this actually um because when originally when furlough came in i think some clients were a little bit concerned about sort of offering that to some people and, and offering them furlough because you know it was for most people it was sort of an 80 percent reduction because a lot of people couldn't afford to top it up but i think what what they found was because their staff were not actually spending as much money so some of them are taking the opportunity to to have sort of the deferment on, on their mortgage for, for three months um and then they're not going out and sort of spending the money that they would normally spend i'm certainly not <laughs> um that they were seeing that as a holiday so other employees were getting a little bit frustrated thinking well you know i'm not i'm not getting paid to, to be at home so this is where that we, we didn't really expect this sort of challenge to come in so some employees have been alternating the caveat to that is they must make sure that the person has been furloughed for at least three weeks so they wouldn't be able to claim for that person on furlough if they didn't have a three consecutive weeks that they were furloughed for so my advice would be if you're going to do that then by all means you can but it just needs to be on a three-week rotation and it's been quite effective for some of my clients yeah it makes sense i think i think the issue of of holidays is one that we've been asked about as well in terms of how does that work there's a specific question here um, but it'll probably help if we address this and then sort of talk a little bit more widely about holidays and how we're sort of addressing that i know we've, we've touched on it but and it says here, if one of my employees was on paid annual leave as of the 1st of March, can I claim grant for him from the 1st of March if I furloughed him from the 1st of March? Since he was on annual paid leave, he wasn't doing any work anyway. And as far as I know, it is allowed for employees to be furloughed and be on annual leave holiday at the same time. So am I allowed to claim from him from the 1st of March for March pay period? What's our thoughts? Do you want me to answer first or John? <laughs> you can argue over that one because <laughs> I was just reading March a lot. <laughs> um, well, I, 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 I suppose I can draw upon some of our experiences. So obviously the sort of Chancellor announced furlough around, was it around the 19th, John? Around that time, wasn't it, that he announced? Yeah. Um, so a lot of our clients had already sort of um, closed their businesses, you know, um, particularly they were in sort of leisure, retail, they'd been forced to close the doors earlier than this. So they were in a time where they didn't have this option. They were looking at things like um, layoff clauses in their contracts, and some of them did actually use annual leave. So the argument there was, well, they've already accrued this. So whilst we don't really know what's going to happen, but we can get any sort of any grants or any loan coming into the business, let's get people to take either paid or unpaid leave. So if that was the situation, then my answer would be yes, because that person, and particularly now that we've got the clarity around annual leave, you know, we've been advised now that you can actually be on annual leave when you furloughed, as long as you do top up that period of time, then most people did have to backdate their letters and their anyway because you know that they sort of it's not announced until around the 19th of, of march and people have been able to claim from the 1st of march but would not have been able to you know you have to be clear and ensure that you can demonstrate that they didn't work during that period of time john have you got anything to add on that one i agree <laughs> 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 me too if that helps me too <laughs> Um, just sticking with furlough for a second, we, we've got sort of uh, 12 minutes left, so we'll get this and then a couple of other ones I've got down here. So um, all things furlough, very popular questions. So 
Can a director who is furloughed as an employee explain whilst on furlough to a client why they can't do a project? So if there's an overlap period and the project is due to go ahead, but then this person has furloughed themselves and then they still need to explain to that client. What's, what's your thoughts there, um, both? That's definitely John Fair's that one. <laughs> to me, I, I guess it comes back to this common sense thing is, is that they shouldn't be working. But if it's, so, so is this a, a current client wanted an update on a project? Or but but I, I guess whether it's a current client or prospect, I suppose it's probably the same. Common sense says to answer the email to say that actually we're closed for the moment and be back on the first or whatever whatever the date may be would seem very very harsh if that were to invalidate a furlough um you know rather you know as in are you, are you generally supposed to just ignore the emails and and, and, and what have you and, and i said this is back to this whole debate gray area about that thing of, of, of employees and particularly directors of what they can or can't do um and particularly if you you know are, are the sole director or potentially the only you know, the, the only director stroke employee of, of, a, of a company so I, I i would have thought that responding to a a query like that to say we're actually closed at the moment can we look at doing the project in june july whatever whatever the date may be shouldn't invalidate a furlough um, you know i i agree absolutely i think and what you've got to consider at the moment is normally if we have a change in legislation, it takes years, you know, years of consultation and consideration before it becomes um, becomes a, becomes a change. This this is unprecedented times and this is something that the government have had to react to very quickly. And so you will find with some of these schemes, they don't, they're not particularly well thought out and there's things that they've not considered, but it's about being fair and reasonable and, and one thing that the government absolutely wants to do is ensure that the that they can improve the economy again, don't they? So I think as long as if they're trying to prevent people from taking advantage of the scheme, and we all know that that would happen if they didn't have some measures in place. But I think it would be, as, as John says, extremely unfair to invalidate something in that respect because arguably all you're doing is sort of kicking the ball down the road aren't you just you're kicking the problem down the road so if people don't respond now employees don't necessarily sort of consider their pipeline for june then we're going to have businesses go pop and redundancies later on in the year as a consequence of this so it's all about yeah yeah common sense needs to prevail in circumstances. right and then we had a question from stuart here um, which came in this week so Stuart says in my mind the glass is half full if you watch the news and the depressing same again questions from the journalists, you think the world is coming to an end and the glass is definitely half empty. So are the panel aware of any new businesses that are starting slash setting up specifically because of COVID-19 and the opportunity it presents? So a bit for all of us, really. So if I, if I start, um, I suppose it's not, not sort of new businesses, but what I have been quite impressed with is, is businesses changing changing tact and being quite innovative um, with the way that they're looking at things. So cleaning businesses, um, changing all of a sudden the way that they're looking at this and there's quite a big opportunity for them into sort of the hygiene area. And I think that one of the uh, economic updates that we had this week was just how people's spending habits will probably change very quickly, whereas normally it takes a few years for public spending habits to change. I think that they will change much quicker um, so a change to more like greener cars, uh, hygiene, health, that type of thing. Um, even down to a friend's dad, who is a, a plumber that I know, um, he's obviously can't work from home, but he started making lamps, which are sort of industrial piping with a lamp in the end of it and the wire going through it. And they're really good, but that kind of, you know, bars that are selling T-shirts and, and jumpers and doing sort of home delivery type of things, I'm not aware of specifically myself businesses opening up because of this, but I'm definitely aware of people being fleet of foot and, and, and moving and adapting quite quickly. But what about you, Go? I'm interested to see you as well. Yes, similarly, I don't think we've had one who's come to us who has started up specifically off the back of this. Um, but I guess with anything, there there are 
there are some businesses that end up doing quite well out of it some i mean i've got i mean he's a friend also who 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 are known I mean, from the other side of the country who has two businesses one sells jigsaw accessories and the other one does um, a website for home learning so you know suddenly you know that, 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 those those two are doing very well at the moment we have other businesses we have one that um puts uh, printing onto kind of bottles um and they've got a big order um ultimately to put the kind of measurements onto medical supplies um because ultimately it's the same process so again you know it, 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 it's it's something that kind of came out of nowhere in a way because that's not what they've been doing to date it's been that's it printing onto bottles predominantly that but actually that the, the, the equipment they have and the technology they can have can 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 do can be used for something different to the NHS. So there will always be some businesses who 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 end up either either by luck, like the the jigsaw guy, or by actually, as you said, being fleet of foot or just kind of tweaking slightly what they do. Um, that actually, you know, there there will always be business to be done no matter what. Yeah, I'm the same really. I'm not aware of sort of, a, I haven't got any any new clients that have just set up, but one of my clients um, produces hand sanitizers. So as you can imagine, they've had record sales. Um, and it, it, it's difficult to snip to, to the point of the question really, because they on one hand are delighted by the sales, but in horrendous circumstances of they being successful so that that can be quite difficult i think for people to celebrate the success right now through through some of the, some of the real sort of um upset and, and misery that this has brought um i do have other clients again who've been innovative and i love to see that entrepreneurial flair at, at times like this so um i've got sort of like gyms that have moved to sort of like virtual pt lessons which i think because they can be so lucrative they'll probably still keep an element of that when we do go back to the gym again um, I have other clients that sort of um, hire, have tool hire. So they've, they've rocketed in sales because everybody's sort of doing DIY right now. So it, it's been um, interesting to see. I, I think it's a, as, as leaders, it, it's, um, it certainly does demonstrate the, the entrepreneurs and, you know, who can sort of adapt to, to these times. And, and the people have been quite shocked actually those of which you've not really adapted very well and have sort of been a little bit like rabbit in, in headlights and you know you, we will be remembered for how we've reacted during this time by you know our, our peers and, and also the people that, that work for us as well so I think it's um, those that have shone will uh, continue to shine afterwards. I, I completely echo that I think that that's that's spot on I was on a, a call yesterday with Professional Liverpool and I think that it's very easy for us um, business owners and, and business minded people to get sort of down a rabbit hole of, of business first and sort of, you know, opportunities and things like that. But ultimately, there's a real human cost to this. And I think that remaining sensitive and, and acting as a good neighbour, I call it, throughout this period, we'll see, we'll see you reap dividends in the long run anyway, because people will definitely remember who was on the uh, correct front for, for versus the uh, incorrect. So um, with just a few minutes to go, I'll just wrap up with sort of a, a general question for everybody. If there's any questions here, there are quite a few questions which I've not managed to answer or get to. We'll try and answer these separately the, uh, afterwards. But um, one thing which I've definitely realised is how much time previous to this I was spending sitting in traffic on the motorway and how perhaps inefficient my day was, even though I thought I was the most efficient person in the world. Um, and the question here is, will this time set a precedent for future home working? Now that people have worked from home, will it be difficult to re revert back to 100% office working? Um, I know my own thoughts, but what, what's, your, what's your thoughts on it? So Victoria, over to you. What's, what's, what's your thoughts on that for, for you and your team? Well, I can see it already, to be honest, because I can see people thinking, right, you know, that the potentially we are going to sort of be back in in work over the next couple of months and you know I, there's, there's a real mix within my office some some of my team have absolutely loved being at home and enjoyed that that work-life balance and to your point I think particularly the people in my team who travel a lot so spend a lot of time on the train from Liverpool to Manchester and stuck in traffic just that 
you know, a couple of hours a day to be able to spend with the family has been very important. I have quite a lot of clients who've been very against home working in the past. And, and don't get me wrong, you know, there's some businesses that absolutely cannot work from home. It's just not at all possible. But for many, it's been more um, a concern around productivity and inability to maybe embrace technology the way they should have. So this has been a really interesting time where sometimes I've been a sort of up against it, sometimes with some employers around the benefits of home working. So I'm hoping that it will um, open their eyes a little bit to the fact that, you know, if you have the right balance, we, we can have very highly engaged, productive, high performing teams by doing a bit of both. So I know from a personal perspective, I'm going to review our home working policy. So we've always been able to work from home, but we've never been sort of, it, it's been as and when it's needed. Whereas I think what we're going to do is maybe look at, well, actually, you know, maybe you can take a couple of days a month where you just want to work from home. You don't need to give me a reason for it. It can just be you, you're taking that day to, to work from home and, and not have to, you know, fight the traffic. So I think a lot of my clients are, are very similar. They're going to try and find a balance between the two moving forwards and embrace home working a little bit more. And John, what do you think to, to wrap up? Yeah, I think similarly. I think, I think it's fine to that balance. We, we, we have... As an example, one of my team um, was working one day from home every week um, because that, that that kind of suited with the kids and what have you. One of the others has been talking about doing that and I said, yes, great. One of my new starters on the 1st of March actually left me three years ago because of the commute, um, has now come back to so we can be flexible over the time she comes in and, and potentially once she settled in, let her didn't expect me work from home three weeks in um, fully but the idea would be once you settled in again she can work from home say a day a week um, and we, we have a couple who, who work slightly different hours to avoid any commute either coming early or late and I think it's that it's that flexibility really and balance you still can't beat actually being together at so you know to, for some of the time for efficiency and the kind of team spirits and what have you but letting people work from home some of the time it is great you know I've been doing it for 20 years when my boss spotted or it's occurred to him how much I was spending on the train. So I worked in Manchester for years. I said, why don't you work from home about a day a week? And it was great. A day of just getting my head down, very few interruptions, getting lots done. More than a day, sometimes you're craving company. So it's balance. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think that everybody will return to a natural level of working if that's uh, i think it would be very very unlikely in, in in my role that this will continue at 100 percent remote it would just be impossible but actually is there a space for this uh to increase capacity and does it suit a need for certain clients absolutely um so just having that sort of uh, adaptable approach, flexible approach, that I think is going to be really useful. But we, we have now reached our uh, our marker. So um, I apologise to anybody who sent in a question we've not managed to get to it, but I hope that's been useful. And um, the aim of these sessions is really to reach out to the uh, to the business community around us and just try and offer any support that we can. That we're fellow business owners just like yourselves. Um, and if there is anything that we can do to support, then please keep an eye on our social media channels. I know we're all on, on LinkedIn and other social media. We will try and hold another one of these sessions again at a regular point in a couple of weeks. Um, and I will try and send out an email in the next couple of days summarising what we discussed and um, a link to the video that we've recorded if you want to watch it back or share it. And uh, so many questions that we've not managed to get to. But I hope you found that useful and, and thanks very much for everyone for attending. So I will, let, I will let you all go there now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I will.